Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to see so many friends and faces, uh, as we have been for the last several weeks on this uh, strange, but in some ways, really powerful Zoom format that continues to bring us all together. And, and no event can tie us even more together as a division and as a group than uh, this event, which has been so thoughtfully prepared. And I'm so uh, delighted that the speakers have agreed to share reflections of really the seminal figure in the history of this division, John Stokel. Um, I am going to leave all of the stories and accolades to my dear colleagues. Uh, I will only say, and I've said this on many occasions, that amongst the many privileges and honors of becoming a chief of this division, the opportunity to dine with John on uh, periodic occasions was at the very, very top of the list. He was, uh, you know, prince amongst all of us and just such a gentle and warm and insightful person and uh, his loss is palpable. Um, and yet our presence and the things we do just is reaffirms his vision and continues that to this day and as we go forward, even during these extraordinary times. So with that, uh, I'll turn this over to uh, my dear colleague, Susan Andrew Levitan, who's the Executive Director of the John D. Stokel Center for Primary Care Innovation to introduce this, the seminar and our speakers. Susan. Thank you, Josh. Um, I wanna add my welcome to Josh's and just share a tiny bit. Um, I first met Dr. Stokel in 1988 as an advisor to the research that I was involved in at Beth Israel on how to measure what matters most to patients. And not surprisingly, he advised us to go directly to patients to learn about this, which was something we were planning to do, but all of our other colleagues had basically tried to discourage us and he was right. Um, when I came to the Stokel Center in 2003, I quickly learned that I could never go anywhere with other medical professionals or anyone who had any relationship with healthcare where I wasn't um, asked to please give my best regards to him. And for years, I carried around a stack of Dr. Stokel regards business cards so I'd be sure to remember. Today, you're gonna to hear about how he inspired and shaped so many people and the delivery of primary care across the country with his wisdom, curiosity, humility, and great good humor. The world would certainly be a better place if we all emulated Dr. Stokel. All of us at the Stokel Center now and everyone who's been there in the past loved having him with us in the office and then visiting him at Brookhaven for the dinners that Josh just mentioned. And we miss him every day. I want to share two pictures that help capture the spirit of this lovely man who means so much to all of us. Um, the first, and I have to show the disclosure. Um, so maybe, um, Brian, if you could show the disclosure and then go to the first picture, which was taken at the, what was then Partners Primary Care Dinner, where he received the Lifetime Achievement Award. And then the next picture was taken at one of his many birthday celebrations with the Stokel Center and the Division of General Internal Medicine staff. So it's now my pleasure to introduce three people who will share their perspectives on his contributions to research, the importance of interprofessional collaboration, and the practice of primary care. So our first speaker will be Dr. Michael Berry, who is the director of the Health Information Decisions um, Program in the Division of General Internal Medicine. And then we'll, we'll hear from Barbara Chase, who is a former nurse practitioner from the IMA and the Chelsea Community Health Center. And then from Dr. John Goodson, who is a primary care physician in the IMA and a primary care advocate. So with that, let's begin with Michael. Great. Um, yeah, to, uh, Brian's gonna stop sharing and I'll take over. All right. Uh, are folks seeing John Stokel's scholarly contributions? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, good to see so many um, old friends and new out there. Uh, I'm gonna spend a, a, a what needs to be a few minutes with a daunting task of reviewing some of John's scholarly contributions. I'm really gonna focus on his early published work just to reflect how ahead of his time he was and how many ideas that are mainstream now sort of started uh, in John's head uh, many years ago. I'll emphasize two themes. One is, you know, John saw that diseases interacted with people uh, 
in unique ways, given their psychological makeup, their social situation. And John felt that you had to understand that interaction to take good care of folks. And um, John was always looking for what many observers have called upstream causes. Uh, while, while other uh, uh, researchers were describing diseases in people who came in to see a doctor, uh, John was really fascinated with what made them come in to see the doctor in the first place. And again, always pushing upstream. And I'll, I'll try to emphasize that as I go. I'm going to try to use John's words in, in, from those uh, early work to give you an idea of how some of his ideas were born. And oh, we'll start. You know, John's early papers were um, focused on occupational illnesses. One of his first was a case series of people with um, uh, disease in beryllium workers, which was used in um, the early fluorescent lights. And John said, because of the great expansion of manufacture of fluorescent lamps, which took place in the US in the late 1930s, many workers were exposed to phosphors containing beryllium. So again, while um, uh, you know, other uh, reviews of beryllium disease had the x-rays and the pulmonary function tests, John wanted to get at the causes and, and particularly what was happening in the industry and reflected the single most important step in controlling beryllium disease was taken by fluorescent lamp manufacturers who in 1949 agreed to discontinue the uh, the use of beryllium in their phosphors. Now, John published this in 1959, reflecting that once you're exposed to beryllium disease, you often paid the uh, beryllium, you often paid the price in terms of disease years later. And it turns out there was a lot of black market beryllium floating around that was used to repair uh, neon lights, um, you know, long after the uh, beryllium was taken out of the original manufacturer. It was sort of cheap and available. And again, John mused about that a lot in terms of the cause of disease. Again, getting to upstream causes. John also did a case series in soft coal miners. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, like other um, researchers, he had the pulmonary function tests and the x-rays. But John was really interested in how do they get exposed to this stuff and why do they keep exposing themselves even after um, the, it was clear it was affecting their health? So John said, uh, with few exceptions, this group came from backgrounds characterized by economic hardship, little schooling, and lack of opportunity for personal and social adva advancement. They had to work hard to subsist and met the challenges of their lives conscientiously with courage and stoicism. Again, not the stuff you'd see in most routine medical reviews of diseases. After the onset of pulmonary symptoms, 14 minors, 47% delayed seeing a doctor from one to 19 years and 22 continued to work for one to 14 years. They often worked despite having been told by their doctors of the nature of their illness and the exposure of avoiding further exposure to dust. Again, that interaction of the disease with a person and their social situation uh, was what John was really interested in. Now we take this for granted now, but if you go back, John wrote in 1962 about how depression presents in primary care. Um, and he had done a series of patients who had come in with what he called at the time functional complaints. Uh, we see them as sort of somatic symptoms of depression now indicating that many of these patients also have the symptoms of a, a depressive reaction. In order to make this diagnosis, it is necessary to obtain a history of, tra of a traumatic event, which has resulted in a loss of self-esteem. Again, John was really interested in what would trigger people to come in with these functional complaints and why they'd come into the medical clinic as opposed to the uh, psychiatry clinic. Again, we take this for granted these days, but John was bringing together the mind and the body in, in, in a way that was very unique and ahead of its time. Um, team-based care. You know, we're still talking about team-based care and trying to figure out what it is. John was working on this uh, years ago. 1963, John has an article in the American Journal of Nursing with some of his nursing colleagues here, uh, thinking about how nurses could be brought into chronic condition management. 
He wrote, we believe that the nurse could effectively meet the needs of many chronic medical patients, folks with chronic diseases. The clinic, which involved uh, nurses um, uh, taking the lead with the care of many patients, provides an important use of the nurse in a professional treatment role with a framework of ambulatory medical practices. Again, 1963, team-based care ahead of its time. We'll hear more about this from Barbara Chase in a little bit. Similarly, social work in the medical clinic. John wrote about the role of the social worker. And in that way, he was following the um, lead of uh, Richard Cabot in the lower portrait with the violin. I was, was fascinated by the similar cant of the head of these two uh, ahead of their time folks, um, just reflecting the intensity of listening uh, uh, and, and attention to other people. Uh, Barbara can say who the model and the top portrait was <laughs> for the patient. Um, so John wrote, in a continuing or on-call relationship with patients, the social worker was often their central source of advice within the hospital's outpatient clinics, a medical care function commonly attributed to the family doctor. Think about how our nurses and case managers often become the primary person interacting with uh, a, a, a person with a chronic illness. Uh, again, uh, born of John's thinking many years ago with the lead from Richard Cabot who founded the first Department of Social Work uh, here at Mass General in, in any medical institution. Neighborhood health centers. So John had a New England Journal article in 1969, the Neighborhood Health Center, Reform Ideas of Yesterday and Today. Um, and he wrote, in a new redefinition, the district served by a, a community health center is not only a community, but a laboratory, one where the effect of healthcare as an independent variable may be measured on the health of a selected population. This research definition of community reflects a special demand for social accounting and a research interest in the social basis of health and illness. Like his description of the role of social workers and nurses, John was really writing about what we call now the social determinants of health. He didn't use that wording, but that's what he was writing about. Um, there's uh, uh, the old uh, MGH Charlestown uh, Healthcare Center, nay, uh, Bunker Hill Health Center, and Roger Sweet, its founder, uh, at the 50th anniversary uh, celebration. This idea that healthcare institutions should take responsibility for a population, I think is unique and still very important these days. I, I often wonder if Harvard Medical School took responsibility for a population, even just its employees, uh, and, and looked at the uh, measures of health of that population, rather than just you know, NIH grants and other things, um, uh, that might be an interesting way forward. Again, John's way of thinking here. And, and I'll just end with John writing about, and there are many articles about the corporatization of medicine. Uh, his classic one was in Annals in 1987, working on the factory floor, uh, where he talked about uh, physicians and clinicians more broadly being employed. What are the implications of medical employment and corporate practice for physicians and patients? Will care really become cheaper, not likely, and more available, hence accessible? For the analyses and developments that may come, Hippocrates, not the CEO, would remind us that the patient's illness is not a standardized distress uh, for uh, standardized care as it arises out of a unique and individual life and that physician's duty is to the individual patients. Again, this theme of the disease manifesting within a particular patient. And uh, uh, although John puts those words in Hippocrates' mouth, I think we can hear John speaking there. For those who um, want to learn more, John edited a book, Encounters Between Patients and Doctors, an anthology where he combined many articles um, that he thought were important in terms of the uh, relationship of, of doctors and patients. Uh, there are many really great and provocative articles. For, for those who know John McKinley, who's a real iconoclast, his chapter was, who's really ignorant, physician or patient? So thought-provoking, and I'd highly recommend it. And I thank you for uh, what's a too small a tribute to John's scholarly work. And I'll turn it over to Barbara. 
and I'll stop sharing. All right, how do I get my PowerPoint up, Brian? <laughs> Share your screen. Down at the bottom. Share screen. And then pull up your slides. There we go. Yeah, great. I'm a novice. <laughs> Um, there it is. Go over and click on, yeah. There we go. There you go. So thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this um, event. Um, losing John was hard, but losing John in my first year of retirement without my MGH uh, family to embrace uh, has made it even harder, and it's, I can't tell you how wonderful it, wonderful it is uh, to see all of your faces today. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about John's contribution to cl clinical care from my perspective um, and from the perspectives of those who came before me um, and shared some of the history of uh, the OPD and the medical clinics. So here's the clinics building in 1940. John came back after um, military service to take the role of chief of the OPD and medical clinics. His office was in the corner on the upper, um, or I should say middle section with the arched windows. He had that office for many, many years um, at the head of the hallway. Um, at the time, just for those of, I don't know if there's how many people are over 50 or 60, but you may not remember these times. Um, at the time, uh, the OPD medical clinics were used as a setting to train residents. Um, residents came one session a week um, they were supervised by attendings. The attendings volunteered their time as part of their appointment um, as physicians at MGH and with admitting privileges. Um, the residents often didn't want to be there because, of course, inpatient medicine was much more important to them. And some of the attendings wanted to be there more than others, shall we say. Um, the patients were often people who had just had a hospital admission. Um, some of them were chronic and came back multiple times, but many visits were one follow-up and that was it. Um, the patients seen in the OPD were the, what we used to call house patients. They were patients without insurance who could otherwise uh, not pay for care. Um, these patients were a lot, largely from uh, the West End, which was undergoing great uh, turmoil in terms of redevelopment, and um, the North End um, with many Italian uh, families. Um, clinic days were uh, hectic. Everyone came at nine or one and sat in the hallway. Uh, um, weights were long, charts were often not delivered, um, results were often not available, and continuity suffered um, because different attendings were present on different days and um, different residents might see the same patient. Um, as John Stokel described this to me, you could tell that he was distressed, um, that this kind of care was thought to be adequate. He was also distressed and, and remained distressed for many years about the distinction that Mass General made regarding insurance, patients with insurance and patients without insurance, and was rather protective of the, of the poor, as uh, patients were sometimes referred to. Um, 
nurses in this setting really performed administrative duties more than anything else at this time. Uh, the nurses tended to be nurses who had been MGH nurses who had risen and um, demonstrated skills, administrative skills and organizational skills. So they were chosen to come to the clinics and run the clinic because the nurse was the person who was there every day of the week. So she would um, make sure the charts came from the record room. She would make sure that the rooms were clean, that there were supplies. She would make sure that the secretaries did the work that they were supposed to do in terms of um, follow-up appointments and check in and check out. Um, billing was incredibly simple in those days, a simple check mark that the person had come to the, to the office on a card. Um, and visits were often delayed. One of, one of the um, stories that Dr. Stokel told me was about the nurses having to call the doctors to come to clinic because as I said, they, they really didn't want to be there very much and sometimes a, a hallway full of patients would be waiting and neither the resident nor the attending would have arrived yet. Um, as care improved with uh, improved diagnostics, uh, improved um, care of chronic disease, management of chronic disease, uh, leading to um, much longer lives and healthier lives, um, the population increased. As well, in the 1960s, a number of um, reforms happened with our government, giving us um, Medicare and um, in the states, Medicaid, or some other uh, state uh, supported subsidy for healthcare. In addition, um, businesses were offering patients insurance through work and that really uh, started to take off in the 60s. So suddenly it was a waiting room full of patients but it was a waiting room that the residents and the attendings just couldn't really manage adequately. Um, Ruth Ferrissey was an RN, MPH, who was the administrative director of the outpatient department. Um, she had a couple of nurses that she felt were outstanding, interested, and willing to try a new role. So she and Dr. Stokel developed a plan for these nurses to have um, nurse clinics. Um, these clinics were the first sign at Mass General that nurses could work independently with patients. Um, these patients came to see the nurse for blood pressure checks, for diabetes management. Uh, back in the day when patients um, did tested a urine sample with a tablet and a test tube and oranase was the drug of choice. Um, but these nurses really liked the role, liked the contact with patients, like the responsibility. Um, and both Ruth Verisi and Dr. Stokel responded to that um, by encouraging it and also um, tapping into um, resources to get a more formal program organized to elevate the practice of ambulatory nursing. Uh, at first it was a few courses, but then it turned into a full-fledged a year-long nurse practitioner program uh, run by MGH and Harvard's uh, continuing education. Um, I was the beneficiary of that program and uh, in hindsight, having then attended graduate school, I have to say that there were um, features of this program uh, like intense didactic followed by uh, intense usage of what you had just learned um, that grad schools have a hard time replicating. Um, so in the, after the first group of nurse practitioners uh, were trained, uh, having nurses see patients for a variety of reasons uh, became uh, very common and um, a, a sought after position. Um, in the system and across the country, actually. Um, yeah. 
in response to um, the increased um, volume of patients that needed to be seen and the interest in ambulatory care practice, a lot of attention was paid to training and training suddenly started to recognize that young doctors needed not just ICU training, but as importantly, if not more importantly, needed to know how to take care of patients in the office in a longitudinal manner. Um, and with that in mind, the primary care unit was um, developed using as its, its basis, the uh, didactic as well as case teaching, collaborative care, um, and again, I was um, very fortunate to have been chosen to work in that um, in that program. I remember my interview with Alan Goral, who asked me a couple of questions um, about my medical knowledge and. Um, I was lucky enough to, to make, the, make the cut. Um, in our unit, we were at one, hall, one end of the hall of what had, was becoming the IMA. Um, nurses, nurse practitioners, medical assistants, secretaries, a social worker dedicated just to our practice, a dietitian for our practice, and multiple subspecialties, including um, psychiatry, mental health, um, and all the medical subset specialties participated um, in our daily activities. Uh, we would have rounds one morning where a patient would come in and be presented to one of the subspecialists and everyone would attend, participate. Um, and then in the evening or early evening, when everybody stopped seeing patients, we would gather to discuss interesting cases. It's interesting over the years, people who participated in this program multiple times have said to me, you know, I miss those closings at the end of the day where we got to talk about interesting cases. Uh, little did they know that John Stokel and I continued that during the time that we practiced together. We would always say good night and as saying good night would review a case. So the, the primary care program was so successful that um, it and other factors um, encouraged attendings to abandon their uh, cubby holes in the Baker Building and the Warren Building where they had private practices and to come to what had become known as the Internal Medicine Associates, which was a unique um, situation at Mass General where the doctors had uh, control of their practice more than if you were a clinic doctor, but yet didn't have the responsibilities um, for the um, bricks and mortar that people in private practice had. Um, the first 13 doctors um, at first were reluctant to have primary care and other residents in their practices, but the unit was such a success that within a, in a very short time, patients were being seen in the IMA in the primary, by the primary care uh, residents as they were dispersed throughout the, the IMA. The goals Barbara, continued. Yep. I am loath to jump in, but um, you are a little bit at time. So maybe if okay, you could, I'll, so I'll we've come, got time I'll come for forward. our next, for Dr. Goodson. Okay, I'll come forward. So um, as, as demand increased, the hospital built the Wang Center and um, we filled it immediately with patients. So here's what John Stokel's practice looked like. Um, if for those of you who knew him, uh, you know that he called patients in the evening and had them come in at 7.30 in the morning, which annoyed administration, uh, but he felt patients needed to um, be seen if, and if they desired to be seen. And if you look at this list, I won't read everything, but doesn't it look a lot like the medical home that we were just trying so hard to reachieve? Um, John Stokel used subspecialists who, by the way, were still part of um, the physical IMA, 
um, and he, we used an early computerized uh, record. Um, John was a great supporter of allied health, including nursing, uh, social work, um, and nutrition. So this is really all I want to say um, about John Stokel, and that is my experience with him is that it was all about relationships. Uh, he wrote a lot about the doctor-patient relationship, um, which was based upon trust and understanding. He was able to accept people who made the worst decisions in life with empathy and to see deeper and to see beyond um, to who they were. And he knew every one of his patients. For those of us who were mentored by Dr. Stokel, I have to say that I think that that was his greatest joy. I don't think anything gave him more pleasure than being creative and using his intellect with other people, creating that bond and that association that you get when you create something with someone else. Barbara, we've got to move on to Dr. Goodson. Okay, two sentences. Sorry. He wanted so to avoid sorry. hierarchy, and if you tried to manage him, you know that. And then I think his greatest characteristic was self-awareness personal growth, the understanding that we were all evolving, and as he would say, we all need to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Goodson. So there's a new phenomena. It's akin to stage fright, and it's called Zoom fright. <laughs> and so there's always that moment when you have to make sure you know what you're doing. And I need to be sure I share the proper screen. And are we there? We're there. Perfect. We're there. So how are legends created? It's an interesting question. Here we are talking about John, John that we experienced through our careers. But John was inspirational. And so how does that come to be? So this is a bit of a chronology of John's long practice life at the Mass General. As Barbara alluded, he came out of the service and went to Walter Bauer. Walter Bauer was trying to recruit him to become a pulmonologist, chief of medicine at the time. He was setting up all the specialty units. John did not want to do that. He wanted to go work with the people. And for him, the people were, as Barbara describes, the, those the indigenous to the West End and the North End and the residents. They were and are always his people. Early on, he got involved with the Harvard Program of Family Health, whereby students were assigned to work with uh, families for a two to three year period of time. And the families had children, the, the women were pregnant. They were part of the delivery and the early child care. 67, working with Roger Sweet, Bunker Hill Health Center. Barbara talked about the original primary care practice and Turtle Medicine Associates, 72, Jim Deneen and other colleagues, Chelsea Health Center, Revere Health Center, primary care program, 1973. I need to... John, can I jump in for just a second? Barbara, you may need to check to see if you've stopped screen sharing because it looks like there's an overlap between your slide and, and John's slide. Just to double check. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for some reason I'm not advancing my slides and I don't know why. It doesn't say, just one second. I don't see it, but where would I click? No, there's only one screen share. And John, do you have that box over your slides again like there was in the beginning? I don't. And I, it, it should be advancing. Aha, okay. There you go. Yeah, good. So, 78, we began the integration of uh, resident practices with the IMA physicians. Cabot Society, 79. We moved to this building, the Wang Building, 82. We achieved the full integration of staff and residents, also 82, Boston Homeless Project, 89, 
MedPeds, 90, the Palliative Care Service, 95, and then, of course, the Stokel Center. The point here really is that each of these represent threads that we currently experience here. John, in some ways, was the great enabler, the great collaborator. In every case, or nearly every case, the ideas for the beginnings of all these things began with other people. And each individual would come to John and say, what about this idea? And John would immediately endorse it and support it and allow that individual, whoever that was, to take that idea and grow it. He was an extraordinary colleague. So others have talked about dinner with John. Uh, this was the last <laughs> experience I had with John. Uh, he was probably 95 at this point, but we had a grand time. So what was it about this man? Those of you that don't know John, those of you that never had any experience, you're hearing about his legacy, but what were the attributes? So there are three themes. The sort of greetings and salutations, and this was one of John's classic hellos. Second is the concept of collaboration at all times and all ways. John always looked to work with others. And then the third issue, which we've heard about already, is the issue of the stories. The stories we hear and the stories we tell. So he was always interested in your personal story. You could talk to John and he would immediately drill into where you were from, what your background was, where you'd gone to school, what you'd studied. He cared about knowing you in depth, but he also believed that we in academic medicine have a story to tell. And as Michael discussed, through his career, John encountered various issues that he felt compelled to still tell the story. The beryllium, the black lung, classic examples. Later, his stories had to do with his own experiences as a practitioner. But he also felt that there were institutional stories that needed to be told. What do we need to know about ourselves as we think about where we have been and where we are going? So just to take the first theme, one of the first projects that John embarked on when we moved into this building was to create this sign. This was his expression of greetings and salutations. And he insisted on finding the word welcome in as many different languages as he possibly could. And I believe he basically looked at the, the entire patient cohort of the Mass General and made sure that there was no nationality that was not rec recognized here. So in the background, it says, welcome to the Mass General Hospital. And I can tell you, I heard that expression a thousand times if I heard it once. John would walk up to some person, a new resident, a new patient, and stay extending his hand, welcome to the Mass General Hospital. But the experience of individuals. So I've asked a few folks to just comment. What was it like to be with John? So Carol Ehrlich, John had a way of finding the sparks in each of us as doctors. He would nudge that spark by leaving a paper to help us think about where we should go next intellectually or suggest a new idea to move our thinking forward or invite us to an event where the conversation would expand our horizons. In his gentle way, what are you going to think about next? After that, what road will you travel next and why? Jim O'Connell, Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. When I began uh, to care for homeless persons in Boston after residency, John met with me each month, not only as my mentor and cheerleader, but as a doctor looking to learn about any obstacles to healthcare faced by those in shelters and on streets. I will forever remember how he cherished my errant career, John, hardly errant, Jim, as critically critic important to the mission of the hospital. And I was blessed by his fervent support and regular letters for the next three decades. I've asked a couple of folks who were part of our training, the evolution of our primary care training, just to talk about what it was like when they met up with John as young, in, in both cases, students at Harvard. So Alan, if you could just explain to the group what it was like when you encountered John in medical school. What was that experience like for you?
Is Alan muted? Alan, you're muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Well, John was the Pied Piper of primary care uh, for wayward Harvard medical students. It started uh, <laughs> for me in uh, 1968 after a lousy day in the anatomy lab. And I went back to Vanderbilt Hall, the dorm at the medical school, and posted on there was a sign. I'm looking for medical, first year medical students who'd like to talk to patients. This was like mana from heaven. And he and uh, some of his friends had decided that first year medical students who don't know anything, quote unquote, would actually take better histories than students in their second and third years. And he uh, took us over to an apartment on Beacon Hill. He had a video set up and he brought in uh, patients of his for us to interview. And that was the beginning. That was the first time in the country uh, where there was formal teaching of the clinical interview for first year medical students. This is 1968. Uh, in that Pied Piper role, uh, he had an opportunity for us to work Wednesday nights at the Cambridgeport Free Clinic, which was a clinic for uh, hippies at the time, street people who didn't want to go to traditional medical uh, settings. And he, and he invited a bunch of us medical students to work with him on those Wednesday evenings. Uh, when I was a fourth year medical student, just at the beginning, the end of third year, um, I had taken my core medicine at the BI, but the model of John as a doctor was so compelling that I decided I'd like to train to be like him. Since I had my medicine at the BI, I took an idea of maybe a new kind of internal medicine residency program to Tom Dobanko, who was the new head of the uh, newly opened uh, Beth Israel Hospital Primary Care Clinic. And Tom said, well, you know, that's very ambitious. I'm not quite ready yet. I just got here. Um, sorry, we can't do it. So I went over and talked to John. And with that twinkle in his eye, he said, of course. And he said, why don't you go to the chief of medicine, tell him what you want to do. And you need to know that Alex Leaf at the time uh, was the chief of medicine, looked very imposing. He almost looked like a Nazi SS colonel. Although he had a heart of gold, uh, his outward look and his shyness were really um, very off-putting because they looked very stern. And John said, no, you go in and see him and it's going to be fine. And uh, lo and behold, fast forward ahead, we had a primary care program. And then he set up, and this is part of, John takes ideas, but he also um, had a very clear sense of what he wanted to do. And just to underscore, because Barbara was there at the time, she was actually our second nurse practitioner, John set up a medical home in 1973, and that was called the primary care unit at the MGH. The, the last thing that John did, which is absolutely remarkable, is he started the first primary care clerkship uh, based on experiences that he and I had in that fourth year, because I basically stayed the year with John and in sub, some subspecialty clinics. And uh, we had the beginning of the primary care clerkship, the first one in the country in 1977. So just remarkable. You go to see the guy and he smiles at you and he says, of course. Alan, Alan, I'm going to cut you off here. I'm done. Run out of time. Larry, I'm going to give you only 30 seconds because I only have a few more minutes here. So just an extremely short summary. I will. I'll give you a start. This is Larry Rohn. I like your theme of uh, John is the great enabler because when I started training, uh, I looked around the city of Boston, trained in medicine and pediatrics and was discouraged and no one would offer this option. I met with John and uh, John basically said, uh, he didn't know whether it was possible or not, but come to the Mass General and we'll try to work it out. I did and we did, so that, uh, that was John's <laughs> contribution. So I spent um, my entire residency and uh, all my time as a staff physician while well before John retired with John, so got to know him. I will point out a couple things though before I stop, which is that in John's world, your individual success was, uh, 
had carried important responsibilities to others and to the one's wider community. He was a disciple of Richard Cabot, as uh, Mike Berry said. And that meant the fundamentals, be kind to patients, be generous with your time, be civil and supportive to your colleagues and coworkers, always work in collaboration and listen and don't talk. So I learned that from John and I think uh, a lot of people on this uh, Zoom will say the same thing, thanks. Thank you, Larry. So I'm gonna wrap it up here just to say that there's more to this story. And as part of the millennium, John and I put together this project up on the sixth floor of the Wang Building. John wanted to be sure that he left for all of us the story, how we got to where we are. Uh, I had the picture painted on the right side from the patient's perspective. And then of course, the one on the left side of Richard Cabot. But let me just kind of go through how this is set up because he wanted to be sure that we knew our roots. This is the chronology of the hundred years that preceded the millennium. He wanted to know who we are. He wanted to be sure that all of us were identified as part of this grand collaboration. And I'll point out to you that these panels are designed to be like the, the windows of a cathedral. They are educational tools. He wanted to know where we are. So we are all over the metropolitan area. And he wanted to be sure that we were committed to our future, which is really what education is all about. And that we were committed to writing and studying our academic story. And this is a really important part of John's own storytelling. He wanted to be sure that everything that we needed, that we developed, was carried forward to the future. So how do we respond to all this? So when John retired, I wrote this. Uh, this was now maybe 18 years ago. So how will we carry on? With difficulty, no doubt. With courage, certainly. You have taught this to us because like all who heal, you have stood with death and contained your fear. With ambition, we hope. You have set a high standard in all domains. It will be our job to build on what you leave us. With affection, broadly, you've been in the corner of our lives forever. For us, there was no time before you. With inspiration, endlessly. Your gentle compassion, your inquisitive temperament, your inclusive practice, your scholarly imperative, cannot be forgotten. With appreciation unspoken, how could we, after all, find the words of the time to encompass how much we owe you for the lives you have inspired us to lead? And I thank you. Thank you. These were beautiful tributes um, to Dr. Goodson. And now we've got a little bit of time for other people um, who may want to join in. And I saw Dr. Winnikoff had a wonderful story in the chat. Um, if, if you want to share that with people. Oh, hi. Uh, hi. Well, yeah, I, it was amazing because in those days, as I think uh, Barbara Chase mentioned, um, the clinic was really not the favorite place of the residents, except I had had an experience in Washington at the free clinic there. And I really wanted to pursue primary care and lo and behold, no, no clinic. So John took me in, I guess, as he has many others. And I actually, along with another resident, put together a report, which may have paved the way for John, uh, Alan, because I really recommended that they start training people in the outpatient department, that it was a, a great uh, breach of, a great breach of, uh, of responsibility to uh, excuse internal medicine residents from the clinic. Anyway, I went on to be the head of the primary care residency at Harvard Community Health Plan uh, the following year. So we all started primary care residencies together, Alan and I, and uh, uh, Steve Levison, who was in my first residency group. Steve? Mm -hmm. I saw Steve here. Steve, do you want to make any comments? 
If so, you may be on mute. Well, maybe whilst, if Steve is still here, I, I see Jim O'Connell and you got mentioned and I just want to jump to see if you have anything you'd like to add. No, after listening to uh, John Goodson's poem, I, it's little, little you can add to the beauty of that. But I would, would say that um, <clears throat> when I was uh, an intern in 1982, I was assigned, as many of you remember, to John's corner of the IMA, which overlooked the Bullfinch building. And what I remember so distinctly back then um, is that he was taking care of more people than anyone I'd ever known. He was <laughs> coming from Central and South America. Um, but the residents with me, one was Jim Thomas. He was a junior in that corner. And he was taking care of the gypsies who lived and wandered oh. off from England. And Jack Rutledge, who many of you may remember, who was an MD uh, uh, and an MD and JD who had come to us from Duke, was taking care of, this was 1982, of the very early AIDS patients. So I'll never forget coming in and seeing John smiling as you looked at the waiting room. And I was given, by the way, a lot of the people who were drinkers who lived on Beacon Hill and on the Esplanade. So the waiting room was the perfect primary care setting for me. And it, I will never forget walking in and seeing that collection of people all thrilled to be in John uh, Stoppel's corner of the world. So it was, a, it was you know, the thing I remember most about my early days. So thanks. Thank you. I'm going to read a comment from Steve Atlas. Um, his patients were so grateful and appreciative of its care. I remember at the holidays, his office looked like a liquor store. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I will admit that um, for his birthdays, when he moved into Brookhaven, one of the customs at Brookhaven is you get invited out to dinner by different people, but if you are the invitee, you have to bring a bottle of wine. So his social schedule was so busy that we would give him cases for his birthday. So he was well equipped to um, be the gracious guest, as I'm sure he always was. So anyone else want to make a comment? I see many of you. I think Steve is on the phone based on what I see. So um, Susan, I, I'd like to make a comment. Ahead, you know, Karen. John, in the days when um, I knew John, which was as a student first in 1976 okay. at the medical school, and then after during the primary care residency, he was one of the men who was an outstanding mentor for women at the time. Uh, and he had such vision about what it meant to be a woman in medicine and what it meant to be a female patient. He gave me his original copy of Our Bodies, Ourselves, uh, <laughs> which I'll treasure. That's wonderful. Um, anybody else want to make a comment? And if not, I'm Susan, going to call. Oh, go ahead, Alan. One of the things that is very striking is that at a time where everybody's talking about burnout, John worked very hard but was never burnt out. And the question is why, and I think it was because of the relationships that he had every day with his patients and with all of us who worked with him. And I think there's a lesson there in terms of having a fulfilling professional life and personal life is that is how sustaining these relationships are and how important they are to our careers and our professional development and ability to continue on. I think that's a critically important um, thing to mention about him because I think he very deeply, it was clear that his work mattered, his family mattered, um, and he had a lot of meaning in his life that I think helped sustain him. So Steve, we called on you to speak before, but you were on the phone. Would you like to make one brief last comment um, before we end? <laughs> and you're on mute, so you have to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I, you know, John, I met John in, uh, also in medical school, and I would say he was um, seminal in everything I've done since then. We I loved the individual time to talk to him. But I think that the thing that struck me the most is when he was on call on a weekend, he would have interviewed every one of my patients about their family, their health. I mean, and I remember it was extraordinary. He came back and, and, and we signed out. He would then do a, a, a small 
uh, session on each one of these patients. That was really remarkable. And I think the key of seeing the patient as a person who was, who was really intrinsic to how he functioned and certainly to how he taught us to function. Thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Cormos, do you want to make a comment? You're on mute. Um, no, I think um, we are at the uh, end of the hour, um, but I think it's been a great way to kick off uh, the Stokel Center uh, Zoom uh, version of our uh, fourth Friday meetings with a tribute to a man who uh, has given so much to so many of us and inspired us to uh, be the kind of doctors um, that we would like to be. And uh, his, as was said before, his presence is still felt uh, strongly uh, in this division and sort of the day-to-day -day work that we do for our patients and certainly uh, walking down that hallway uh, every morning to the IMA, uh, we get to see his smile, uh, which is uh, a great thing to see to, uh, to start the day. Um, but I just want to thank all of our speakers, um, Susan for moderating, uh, people who've shared their reflections uh, of John. We uh, do miss him greatly. And uh, just one more reason to hate 2020. Um, <laughs> and so happy that when this year will uh, go away, but um, he, his uh, presence will uh, continue on and we will be sure to uh, keep that going. Um, I know that uh, some of his family has joined us uh, today on Zoom, and I'm so grateful uh, that they are able to do that, and hopefully they are able to see uh, what a great effect uh, John had uh, on all of us. So I hope uh, people can continue to join us uh, as we continue these uh, seminars on the fourth Friday of the month. Look for the announcements from Pat. And don't hang up. We have one last picture to show. Brian, if you could pull up that last picture. Um, this was taken at his 65th year where he received his pin for being at Mass General for 65 years. And we went over together. And if you've never been to one of these events, they have a group of MGH employees who dances to some song, whatever the iconic song for each five-year period is. And John was practically getting up and dancing the entire um, event. He thoroughly enjoyed it. And I just loved this picture of him. And they had to make a special pin um, because there, were, I think Paul Russell was the only other person who'd been at Mass General for 65 years, which is quite a remarkable achievement. So with that, thanks to all of our wonderful speakers. Thank you for your reflections. And um, may we never forget his message and the way that he took care of his patients and all of us. So thank you very much. Have a great day.